Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Dissecting the Ecological and Molecular Mechanisms Underlying the Interaction Between Plant Viruses and Their Insect Vectors, presented by Dr. Punya Nachapa, Associate Professor, Department of Biology, Purdue University. We are excited to bring you this educational webcast presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. I'm Julie Simaroth of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window. Or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credit. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom right-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Punya Nachapa. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Hey, hello, everybody. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, my research, which focuses on understanding the ecological and molecular interaction between plant viruses and their insect vectors. And down here on the uh, slide, you can see some of the viruses that I work with that I'll be talking about during my presentation. So plant pathogens are transmitted from plant to plant in two main routes. There's plant mediated, which can include mechanical contact between plants. There's vegetative propagation via cuttings, grafting, uh, a plant, a plant uh, pathogens can also be seed transmitted, pollen transmitted, and also this very unique mechanism via a parasitic plant called daughter that can transmit through its vines the, the pathogen or the virus from one plant to another. You also have something called vector mediated. Now this term might be new to many of you, but a vector is an animal or an organism that transmits the pathogen from one infected host to a healthy host. A very common example is mosquito that transmits plasmodium, which is the pathogen that causes a malaria disease from one human, from the infected human to a healthy human. But my research is focused on plant pathogens, which is what we'll talk about today. The majority of pathogenic uh, bacteria and fungi do not require an, a vector, uh, you know, an animal to transmit it from one plant to another. But most plant viruses do in fact need vectors or organisms to transmit them from one host to another. And these vectors include insects, mites, fungi, and nematodes. Among these uh, various vectors, Insects occupy predominantly the largest group, comprising about 64 percentage of all the known vectors that transmit plant viruses. Now, plant virus and the vector, they interact very closely. The, the virus is within the insect, and oftentimes it's multiply, multiplying and replicating within the insect, also within the plant, and this can lead to a myriad and several different interactions between the virus, the insect, and the host plants. So you can have direct effects, that is when the virus seen here affects the insect vector, in this case is an aphid, directly due to the presence of these virus inside the aphid. And these effects can be positive, negative, or even neutral when there's no effect at all. When I say positive effect, I mean the virus increases the vector uh, reproduction rate or develop or shortens the development time. Sometimes it can even come for protection against predators and parasitoids. So those are what I say 
positive effects. And negative effects would be something where the uh, vector fitness is reduced. Now, the virus can also affect the vector indirectly. Just let me get rid of my pointer here. Indirectly via the plant. So the virus can uh, multiply within the plant, as, we, as I've already told you about. And then due to the feed and due to changes in the plant metabolism, that can then indirectly affect um, the insect vector. And again, you can have positive, negative, and neutral effects. Uh, similar to the direct uh, effects, there could be changes in reproduction, development time, longevity, and even uh, changes in behavior. So needless to say, this is a very complex interaction, and um, not one sort of um, mechanism fits all the different insect vector uh, systems. So the central questions that I study in my lab at Indiana University, Purdue University in Fort Wayne is to understand how plant viruses affect biology and ecology of their insect vectors, and what plant and insect mediated responses or mechanism underlie this uh, complex interaction. To do that, I use an integrative approach uh, by looking at the ecological outcomes at the organismal scale and molecular processes at the suborganismal level. So basically using both um, plant assays and insect assays as well as molecular tools. Uh, and you'll see throughout my talk um, examples of this approach. So as I said, um, each system, plant virus vector system is unique. And I study uh, two systems. One is tomato spotted wilt virus in Western plover trips, which I've actually studied in the past during my postdoctoral uh, research associate experience at Kansas State University. And currently, I study soybean vein necrosis virus and soybean thrips interaction. But what's common to both of them is they both these virus, uh, viruses belong to the genus Tospovirus. And the insect, as the last name denotes, <coughs> are thrips. You can see this term here. Now, what's interesting is there is no singular thrip. Both singular and plural is thrips. There is no thripsis, if you will. So Tospovirus is probably the most important plant virus um, that affects a wide range of crop plants throughout the world, over 1,000 crops, which is uh, you know, a, a huge range for a plant virus. Currently, there are around 20 identified Tospoviruses and 15 thrip species that are known to transmit them. What's important to understand here is that Tospovirus are exclusively transmitted by thrips. No other insect can transmit Tospovirus. And thrips predominantly transmit just this um, genus. Now, Tospovirus will cause over a billion dollar in annual loss, specifically this one, tomato spotted wilt virus. So understanding the virus vector interaction is crucial for management to, uh, to develop management strategies. Here are some pictures uh, showing um, some of the symptoms of tomato spotted wilt virus on tomatoes. You can see these pots. Um, actually, the, you have concentric circles if you pay closer attention. This is um, impatient necrotic spot virus, which is uh, in um, uh, peppers. And this is um, soybean necrosis virus, as you can see. Um, uh, the typical uh, necrosis or the dying of the tissue along the veins, and hence the name soybean vein necrosis virus. I'm sorry, I, I think I made an uh, error here. And this is impatient, yes, impatient necrotic spot virus, and then this one right here is iris yellow spot virus. Now, as I said, all tospoviruses are transmitted by thrips, and the mode of transmission is what we call persistent propagative. What I mean by that is the virus replicates within the insect tissues and is then transmitted once it's acquired, which is illustrated here in this diagram. So uh, thrips would, uh, 
would acquire the virions while feeding on the host on an infected host plant as you can see the virions passing here through the mouthpath the esophagus it then moves on and infects uh, the foregut of the insect and from there on to the midgut which has three sections and threats midgut 1 midgut 2 and midgut 3 you don't see too much infection in the midgut 3 predominantly in midgut 1 from there the viruses then trans move um, past the midgut epithelial to these tubular salivary glands. You can see these tubes that connect the midgut to the principal salivary glands up here. And there are also structures called efferent ducts that, that also connect uh, the midgut to the salivary glands. The virions move through there and infect the salivary glands and then when the, when the insect feeds on a healthy plant and they salivate, the virions are transmitted to the healthy plant. So this is called a persistent propagative manner of transmission. So another interesting feature about this and the, the, the specificity of the interaction between the virus and the TRIPS vector is illustrated by the fact that it's the larval stages and when I say larvae, I mean immatures in this case, or the babies or offsprings, so to speak. It's the first instar, or the very first larvae that emerges. Acquisition of the virus at that stage is crucial, and that stage lasts for two hours. The next stage, which is the second instar you can see here, they can also acquire it, but to a lesser extent. So acquisition decreases as the larvae ages. The pupil stages are two, and they do not feed, thereby they don't acquire the virus. Uh, and then the virus is passed on transstadially from one stage to another, and the adult threads, you can see the female here, and here's the male, which is smaller, both of them can transmit. However, adults can only transmit if they've acquired the virus in the first instar larval or second in star larval stages. Adults cannot, well they can acquire, but they will not be able to transmit the virus. So then the question arises, how is that that only adults that acquire the virus uh, in the first in star stage can transmit it? And there's some evidence that in the larval um, anatomy, uh, the answer lies in the larval ana anatomy of these tips in the sense that during the first and star stages, the salivary glands, you can see here, got to get this um, air, my arrow, the salivary glands are in close contact with the midgut, the anterior part of the midgut that I talked to you guys about, which is the site where we saw most of the infection. So this allows the virions to pass through very easily just by direct contact. This may be the reason why first instar larvae um, that acquire the virus can transmit it as adults. So looking at the specific uh, virus vector system, let's talk about tomato spotted wilt virus and TRIPS vector. As I said, the pathogen is a tospovirus, and tospoviruses are in the family Bunya viridae, although I, do, I believe there's been an update recently, and it, ex and it infects close to 900 to 1,000 plant species worldwide. The insect vector, there are several sub species that can transmit. Some it is spotted wilt virus, but uh, Franklinella occidentalis, which is western flower thrips, this insect here that you see, is the main vector. Now it looks pretty large uh, in this figure, but um, they're not really. Adults measure two millimeters, which is no longer uh, than your eye, a single eyelash. So working with these insects is a challenge. And these are symptoms of um, tomato spotted wilt virus on peanut. You can see the beautiful concentric circles here, and which is why it gets its name um, spotted. But of course, it doesn't only affect tomato. I've already talked about this in the introduction, so uh, I'm not going to go over it again. So I was interested to understand what affects um, or what affects 
Dermatitis polyvalent virus has on its insect vector on um, Franklinella occidentalis. What we found was that um, virus infection of the host plant of tomato improved insect uh, fecundity or reproduction. In other words, insects, western flower thrips that fed on tomato spotted wilt virus infected plants had higher fecundity, as you can see here. Infected uh, thrips feeding on infected plants had higher fecundity almost twice in three separate replicates, one, two, and three, compared to those that fed on uninfected plants. So in some manner, virus infection in um, the host plant improves the plant quality. And this is what we refer to as a positive indirect effect, Remember the one I was talking to you guys about uh, in the first couple of slides. Now, we were further interested to understand what is the mechanism that's improving the plant quality, um, you know, so that it benefits the vector. To do that, to do that, we used microarrays. So microarray is nothing but um, a, a gene chip, essentially a chip that is spotted on with these different um, genes or cDNAs of tomato or which were uh, species of uh, plant or animal you're working with. And we were interested in the tomato gene, gene chip. So we used this from a company called Affymetrix. Um, it, it is right now some microarrays are a, a slightly outdated technology. People usually go in for RNA seq where you can sequence the, you know, the global or the total transcriptome. Whereas on the chip, you are restricted to whatever oligonucleotides or genes or cDNAs that is spotted or that's present on your gene chip. Nevertheless, um, the tomato gene chip had uh, close to 10,000 or little more than 10,000 genes, which is a lot, which is a significant number. So we had um, three different treatments, and these are volcano plots showing um, uh, the number of genes that, uh, that we considered were significantly different with respect to the uh, mock inoculated or control treatment. So let me go back so I can explain this. Oh, I jumped ahead too much. Okay. So this is an actual, one of my actual microarray chips that had those 10,000 uh, odd genes spotted on them. And, this, and each pixel or spot that you see on this volcano plot, uh, plot is a gene that was on this chip. So uh, we had two levels of uh, differentiation, uh, fold change, or two levels of significance, fold change, and also the p-value. So uh, anything that, essentially any, any spot that's in red is what we consider significantly different compared to our um, control treatment. So with respect to tomato spotted wilt virus uh, treatment, we had a total of 307 genes that were differentially expressed compared to the mock treatment in which we just mechanically inoculated the plant without the virus, just to simulate the same level of damage. So on the right-hand side, on this side, the genes are upregulated or positively expressed, as you can see here with the fold change, and on the left-hand side are ones that are negatively uh, expressed, so they are downregulated. But in either case, both sets of genes, the ones in red, are about the P level of uh, 0.05, which is the um, base level that we set it at. So uh, TRIPS significantly um, expressed a total of 171 genes, which is almost half the number of the virus-infected genes. And this is understandable because when a virus infects a plant, every cell, it's systemic, every cell is infected, whereas TRIPS feeding is very local. And the combination of virus and TRIPS had the most number of genes, 424 genes, almost an additive effect. And this is not surprising because you have two different attackers, the virus and uh, the insect, which means the plant will have to activate uh, a lot more or twice the number of genes. 
to combat it. We were specifically interested in defense pathway genes, specifically two pathways, the salicylic acid pathway. And this pathway is predominantly expressed uh, in response to the pathogen. And jasmonic acid pathway, which is um, upregulated in response to insect or thrips feeding. What we found was that virus infection upregulated, you can see all the positive numbers, they upregulated salicylic acid pathway. I'm only showing you a subset of three genes here, but I'll, we had close to 20 to 25 genes. And there was a concomitant reduction in um, jasmonic acid pathway genes, which means virus infected plants downregulate the pathway that the plants use to uh, defend themselves against uh, insects and including thrips, which means the plants are more susceptible to thrips infection and, and they are, you know, because they don't have their defense mechanism on, insects will find them more uh, readily attackable because they don't have to turn on, uh, you know, defend themselves against these plants, um, you know, defensive pathway. So thrips feeding down-regulated, as you can see, at the salicylic acid pathway, which is understandable. They don't turn on. Uh, it doesn't, trips feeding doesn't cause a plant to turn on um, a pathogen-regulated pathway, whereas uh, the jasmonic acid pathway was, in fact, turned on. But interestingly, in plants that had both virus and trips, you did not see a down-regulation in either of the pathways which suggests that the plants are able to um, manipulate or modulate their defense mechanisms such that both salicylic acid and jasmonic acid pathway uh, can be upregulated, not to the same level as they did when they, were, uh, they had a single attacker. You can see the levels here, slightly uh, lower, but still the plant is able to uh, defend against both attackers. But what's key to understand is that in virus-infected plants here, salicylic acid pathways are upregulated, but jasmonic acid pathway or the insect-related pathway is downregulated, making the plant more um, suitable or more susceptible to insect attack. And that's what we saw. Maybe one of the reasons why uh, virus-infected plants uh, were more uh, preferred for thrips, and that's why their fecundity increased if you remember uh, from the slide that I showed you. The other aspect of um, plant metabolism is nutrients, and nutrition can also increase insect fecundity. So we uh, analyzed free, total free amino acid contents in plants. There was no change in amino acid content between uninfected plants and thrips spread plant. They are the same level. But in plants that were infected with tomato spotted wilt virus or the combination treatment, you saw a significant difference compared to uninfected with thrips plant, which means that virus infected plants have higher protein free amino acid content, which must have also might have might have also contributed to improving vector fecundity. To summarize this part of my research, we found that um, tomato spotted wilt virus had a positive indirect effect on the insect vector trips by improving fecundity. We also saw, uh, analyzed host preference, which I didn't talk about today. We believe that two main factors may have contributed uh, to this positive effect. One was the defensive crosstalk, that is upregulation of salicylic acid pathway and uh, down-regulation of jasmonic acid pathway and the insect-related pathway, which allowed the insects to readily feed on the plant and not have to deal with the plant defenses, and increase in amino acid content, which is critical for insect development. And these amino acids were in increased in the virus-infected plant compared to uninfected plant. In terms of the direct effect, it's largely neutral. Um, Tomato spotted wilt virus doesn't seem to impact, have a positive or a negative impact on um, Western flower thrips fitness. 
So switching on to the current system that I study, another TOSPO virus, which is soybean vein necrosis virus, SVNV. You can see some um, pictures here with the, um, I should say, symptoms, view of the symptoms. And it's interesting because unlike um, tomato spotted wilt virus, which is very systemic and it infects all the cells, uh, SVNV is very localized. And within a plant, if you were to test a plant, this um, section of the plant tissue, and were to obtain positive for SVNV, and were to test this portion where you don't see much of the lesions, this one would be negative. So within the same plant, it, it, uh, same leaf, in fact, uh, the virus doesn't seem to be moving as well or is not as systemic as compared to tomato spotted wilt virus. It's a newly identified soybean tospo virus identified in 2008 in Arkansas and Tennessee. Um, in 2012, soybean threats was confirmed as the vector, and you can see the adult insect here. This is the first instar, the one that is more efficient in acquiring the virus, and this is the second instar. Given that it's a new, a newly described uh, disease, there's not much information on the disease and the insect vector, although the insect vector is found in almost all soybean fields that we've sampled. So it's predominant, but not of um, major consequence uh, until recently. So this is the spread of SVNV currently. And when I say currently, we haven't had other, more states um, reporting it, but it's possible that they are in other soybean growing regions of the Midwest, like Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota, and Nebraska. But very quickly, within a matter of five years, the disease spread to most of the major soybean growing areas, and now it's even found in Ontario, Canada. So as I mentioned briefly, we survey uh, soybean fields using what we call a suction trap. This is what this, these traps look like, and they sample the air and collect threats. We found up to eight different species, not including, um, including, I'm sorry, including soybean thrips, just not in this uh, list right here. So there's a lot of thrips species in soybean fields, and these suction traps are, are uh, distributed throughout the Midwest. We sample the ones in Indiana. So the the point that I'm alluding to is that uh, that there are other TIP species, some of which are known to transmit other TOSPO viruses that could also transmit soybean vein necrosis. So what we also found in this in this system is that SVNV infection improved TIPS fecundity, not to the same extent as tomato spotted wilt virus, but there was like a 15-20% um, increase in fecundity or reproduction of SVNV infected individuals compared to uh, the uninfected individuals. However, when we analyzed um, the log copy, the virus copy numbers in each of these females, and if you look at the relationship between SVNV and fecundity, you see a strong negative correlation. So higher the so you can see this, the negative correlation very clearly. So basically, the higher the viral, uh, viral copy number of virions in the insect, the lower the fecundity. So to some extent, it seems uh, that the virus is beneficial, but as the virus level gets higher, it seems to um, have a negative effect on the fecundity. Now other, I should mention that other life history traits we did look at were not different. It was only fecundity that was different. We also looked at host preference or feeding behavior. I know it's uh, it's a little busy, and I should have had one of them come in, uh, uh, this graph come in a little later. But we'll just focus on this one right now, which is host preference of infected soybean trips, which is the, the so-called, the, the vector, right? The ones that are infected are the ones that tend to spread the virus. What we found is that infected adult thrips preferred unanimously from the get-go in a time course experiment, they preferred uninfected leaf or a healthy plant. And uninfected soybean thrips initially seemed to have preferred 
the infected plant, but then they change and switch over their uh, preference to an uninfected plant. Now what this means, the fact that infected soybean types prefer healthy plant, this means there is a high potential uh, for virus spread, the, that these infected insects, insects will seek out preferentially these healthy plants and transmit the virus and potentially lay or overposit their eggs there, then the first instar will emerge, they'll, be, they'll get infected by feeding on this infected material and uh, spread the virus. So uh, the potential for virus spread is, um, is huge uh, with the outcome that we saw in this system. Now I mentioned about the eight different species that we found in Indiana. We were interested in the top three species um, because these species, of course, from 50% of the um, soybean thrips uh, population in, in, uh, in a soybean field. I'm sorry, it, they form 50% of the thrips population in soybean fields, and the three top species were soybean thrips, eastern flower thrips, and tobacco thrips. And you can see the pictures here. This one's eastern um, soybean thrips. The, the blackish one is tobacco, and the yellowish uh, looking one is eastern flower. Um, so we were interested to know if these three species would be, would be potential vectors, especially tobacco thrips, which is known to transmit other toxicoviruses. Now, eastern flower thrips is interesting. It's never been known to be a vector. But we were interested in it because it was the most predominant uh, species in our thrips captures, and we wanted to see if they can transmit as well. So we tested for SVNV presence in the insect itself, and this is an RT-PCR gel showing the presence of SVNV NSS, which is a non-structural protein amplicon in the insect. And we did, in fact, detect it in all three species. Uh, a lot more, I should say, um, intensity or uh, concentration of the virus in the soybean thrips, which is ST, uh, and tobacco thrips. But we do see a significant uh, presence in eastern flower thrips itself. This was a, a very interesting and um, finding for us, which uh, you know necessitated that we uh, look at it further. So we then tested if these insects could transmit the virus then to and, um, healthy plants. So we performed whole plant assays and what we found was that N variables, which is soybean thrips, had the highest um, level of uh, virus infection or are able to transmit the virus most effectively up to 70 percent, followed by tobacco thrips, which uh, which did around 35-36%. Uh, uh, and finally, eastern flower thrips, franklinella tritsi, they were able to do it up to 7%. But still, uh, the, the, you know, given that they, I said that they, they formed the largest proportion in our insect captures from soybean fields, uh, it's possible that, uh, you know, with these high numbers, they could overcome the low transmission rate. So we were interested to know why these different thrips uh, species have these different transmission rates and uh, to understand a little more the dynamics within the insect. To do that, we performed um, confocal uh, microscopy experiments and I'll explain this a little briefly to you. Um, so essentially, first in stars were of not just soybean tips. This is just a picture of one species. Uh, of the three different species were given access uh, what we call acquisition access period of 24 hours on virus infected tissue and SVNV infected tissue and then they were allowed to um, develop to adulthood on clean tissue. Then uh, 24 hours post eclosion, the adults were dissected and their guts and salivary glands were labeled for confocal microscopy. So you can see parts, this is after the dissection, the guts are being excised out, the entire elementary canal actually. And this picture shows it a little better. You can see all of the structures. So you have your uh, foregut here. Uh, there are, here's two lobes of the principal salivary glands. You can see midgut one, the main site of infection, midgut two, 
and also midgut 3. And then you have uh, these two tubular structures, uh, the tubular salivary glands that connect the midgut um, to the principal salivary glands. Uh, so this is looking at um, immunolabeling experiments in soybean thrips after SPME infection after six hours of acquisition access period on virus infected plant. The first panel here from A to D is a uh, healthy uh, or an uninfected insect that was exposed to healthy plant tissue and you don't see any virus. Virus is uh, was labeled uh, with um, is labeled green and the way we did it uh, was by using this fluorescent dye F FITC which is conjugated to an antibody um, against the primary antibody which targets SVNV. Um, but in the infected tissue you can see the, uh, the, uh, the fluorescence is very obvious. Uh, here you can see it in the foregut which is denoted by the yellow arrows here. In the mid gut, you can see some light ones in the tubular salivary gland and not so much um, in the principal salivary glands. So this is after six hours of AAP. Um, I should also mention that um, the blue are the, the DAPI staining for the nuclei and the red is actin. So this is looking at immunodetection in um, soybean thrips after 12 and 24 hours. The first panel on top is 12 hours and E through I is 24 hours. And you can see very clearly in comparison to the previous images, these images are green fluorescing with the, the virus. So you can see it in the mid gut here, in the fore gut, in the tubular salivary glands, and the principal salivary glands just after 12 hours. And the same case here after 24 hours. So this confirms, this is already known, but um, nobody had performed the confocal microscopy experiment to actually look at the uh, protein in the insect. But this confirms the presence of uh, that soybean tips are um, the vector. This is looking at SVNV after 24 hours AAP. We didn't do the time course with the Eastern flower, which is EFT and, and tobacco trips. The top panel is, um, FASCA, which is uh, tobacco thrips, and the bottom panel is um, eastern flower thrips. And again, you can clearly see virus infection in, in FASCA in the mid-gut. The tubular salivary glands and the principal salivary glands very clearly. And same with the eastern flower too. It's very clearly seen in the principal salivary glands. And, I, and um, detection of the virus in the principal salivary gland is important because if it's present in the principal salivary glands, then the virus will definitely come out into the lumen and then through the saliva. It's not just present. The presence in any other structure um, may not indicate or may not correlate with virus transmission as much as presence in the principal salivary gland does. And you can see it in the mid-gut as well. So uh, to conclude um, this talk, uh, there's a lot of information that we are starting to accumulate about virus vector interactions, but there is need to understand specific genes and proteins, which uh, will help us in identifying um, technologies or strategies that can help limit um, the transmission of plant pathogens. We're a long way from there because uh, it's a challenging system. Threats, as I mentioned, are, sm uh, are small, uh, but still there have been um, there has been a lot of progress, especially with the tomato spotted wilt virus and um, Western flower trip system in understanding the genes and proteins uh, that are involved in virus transmission. And with, le with that, I'd like to thank my um, funding sources. Um, including present and past funding, and of course my, my team here at IPFW, my graduate students and undergraduate students, some of whom are in this picture here, past collaborators and current collaborators. And I'd end my talk and take questions at this time. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Nachapa, for that informative presentation. It's time for Q&A. If, if you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. If we are unable to get to your question, we will follow up with you via email after the presentation. Let's get started. Our first question is, does soybean vein necrosis virus cause yield loss in soybean? Newly identified, there was not much known about it. Let me go back and answer this again just to be sure uh, that everybody heard it. Um, for the for the longest time, we had no idea if it did uh, cause yield loss. There was anecdotal evidence that it, it caused yield loss to up to 46%, but a, a paper was recently published uh, which actually shows that soybean vein necrosis does not reduce yield. However, oil content and uh, fatty acid contents are uh, decreased which means that it would affect the quality of the, the, the seed and not so much the quantity. But that would still impact, um, you know, um, productivity for, uh, or if, for the growers. Thank you for that answer. The next question is, why are some thrip species able to transmit virus better than others? Fully loaded question. I don't think we know. That is a fully loaded question. I don't think we understand all the factors because there could be so many factors, including genetic and environmental factors, right? So as I said, um, the virus has to move through these different organs as it makes its way up to the salivary glands. So there could be different barriers to, to transmission. It needs to escape the mid-gut epithelium, escape, um, and then, uh, you know, escape the salivary gland um, tissues and get into the lumen. So there could be uh, challenges and um, blocks to transmission during that mechanism. There's also insect immunity that can kick in. And as I showed in my um, SVNB uh, presentation, virus level starts to go down um, after once it reaches, you know, um, a high point. So um, the, immu the immune response kicks in, which may cause um, trade-offs with fecundity. So um, there could be several mechanisms. And then environmental temperature and, and um, humidity can also affect transmission, also the host plant. So there are several factors that need to come together. But in, um, if you just think about the insect, uh, we know that the virus interacts with the specific, you know, putative receptors in the insect gut. And then there could be expression in these uh, receptors that might differ between the different species. Or one species may be um, having a totally different type of a receptor. So, um, Again, that would go back to the genetics that would vary between uh, these different species. Thank you. We'll wrap up with one more question. And that question is, how can the knowledge of genes and proteins help in developing disease control strategies? So um, that's a great question. So understanding it both in the plant and the insect vector is important, or the insect is important, because that way you could develop transgenic technologies. You could either knock down the genes, or over if there's a gene, for instance, um, in the insect, one that is uh, the putative receptor could be knocked down or silenced, and then, which would not allow the virus to bind to the insect. 
in the plants, you could think of potential genes that could be overexpressed, like a defense gene that could protect the plant against uh, this pathogen. Or you could make transgenic plants that uh, have uh, proteins that might block um, these putative receptors in the insect. And a similar st and a study on these lines was published by my previous collaborators. Uh, who are now at North Carolina State University. So essentially, uh, by understanding genes and proteins, you could develop transgenic technologies in the insect and the plant uh, that could make them unable, make the insect unable to transmit the virus or make the plant more resistant to the virus. Great, thank you. And it does look like we have one more question. And that question is, can toastful viruses be transmitted by seed or pollen? Until recently, until last year, until last year we had no idea that toastful viruses could be transmitted um, via uh, seed, but uh, interestingly, SVNV was uh, was found to be trans seed transmit to a very small extent, actually only six percent. But still, it's the first TOSPO viruses that can be transmitted by seed. But note, uh, I don't have uh, any knowledge of uh, TOSPO viruses that can be transmitted uh, via pollen, uh, which would uh, have implications for the bee population, I would imagine. But um, I don't, I don't believe they do. I would like to once again thank Dr. Nachapa for her presentation. Do you have any final comments? See everybody at LabRoot, and I hope you uh, enjoy. I want to thank everybody at Lab Roots for uh, giving me this opportunity, and I hope um, the audience find uh, the presentation useful. Thank you once again, Dr. Nachapa. I would also like to thank Lab Roots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December 14, 2017. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>